and I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening. For those of y'all, uh, there's some maybe that may not have met me earlier tonight, but for, for video tonight's event, my name is Matt Green. I am president of our local Federalist Society chapter. We are the Bart and Alex Howard chapter of the Mobile Federalist Society. Uh, the Federalist Society is a nonpartisan, conservative, and libertarian organization dedicated to freedom, federalism, and judicial restraint. Uh, the Federalist Society seeks to promote the uh, legal ideas and uh, help the legal community through its programs and publications about how uh, limited constitutional government based on the rule of law can have a positive effect on law and public policy. Uh, the Federalist Society is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom and that the separation of powers is essential to that scheme and to our Constitution. And that is emphatically the duty and province of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what it should be. The society seeks to promote an awareness of these principles and to further their application through its activities like we have tonight. I'm uh, very excited to be hosting uh, Dean and Professor and Attorney Bruce R. Jacob. Uh, many of you may know from our uh, promoting of this event, Professor Jacob was uh, a young assistant attorney general from the state of Florida who argued the famous and landmark case of Gideon versus Cochran, which turned into Gideon versus Wainwright by the time the issue of opinion was handed down in March of 1963. Yeah. So it's about 53 years ago, almost. That's right, ago. almost exactly. Exactly. So uh, he's actually 27 years old. He actually married the same year, uh, had taken a new job. A very exciting time for him. Uh, he had to go up against probably one of the uh, most formidable uh, advocates and later Supreme Court Justice, A. Fortas, who was appointed by the court to represent Clarence O'Neill. Uh, so fascinating case. And luckily for Bruce, he's, he's the uh, only one left, so there's only one truth, which you hear tonight. <laughs> uh, briefly, let me tell you a little bit about Bruce, and I'll uh, turn it over to him. He is a Dean Emeritus and Professor of Law at Stetson University. Uh, he has also been the Dean of Mercer University as well. He was a law school dean for a total of 16 and a half consecutive years at Mercer and, and Stetson. Uh, just six years after this case, he was appointed by the United States Supreme Court to represent an indigent defendant in the Kaufman case, which he prevailed on, uh, which is a remarkable uh, turn of events, especially considering that his former uh, adversary, A. Fortas, was then on the court. And he won that case, and that was uh, Kaufman versus United States. Uh, he's the, after the case, after the, uh, the Gideon case, uh, he became a great champion, actually, of indigent defendants. And he's done a lot with uh, prison defendants, uh, those who can't afford counsel or legal representation. He actually, uh, Bruce actually established the Harvard Prison Legal Assistant Project from uh, Massachusetts prison inmates, prison inmates. He also established the uh, Legal Assistance for Inmates Program for Indigent Inmates of the United States Penitentiary in Atlanta. You know, his prosecution days were somewhat finite compared to your whole career. Yeah. Three years, approximately, two, two, two years. years uh, so uh, he's, he's really, he's a highly decorated uh, attorney. He's received actually the annual champion of Indigent Defense Award presented by the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Uh, back in 2013, which would have been right around the 50th anniversary of Gideon. Yeah. Um, he's, uh, he's also obtained the release from the Columbus City Workhouse of as many as 750 indigent inmates who were being held in violation of the United States Supreme Court decision in Take Me Short. He's also participated in and actually established the Emory Legal Assistance uh, for Inmates Program, which provided legal assistance for uh, indigent inmates of the United States Penitentiary in Atlanta. This is in the, the late 60s. Um, the, the Gideon versus Wainwright case is really a remarkable story. Uh, many of you may have read, it, it was somewhat sensationalized by Anthony Lewis's book called Gideon's Trumpet. Uh, it's written shortly after the case by New York Times reporter Anthony Lewis, who recently passed away about a year ago. But Anthony actually, Mr. Lewis did a pretty good job detailing the case, but there's a lot of things, there are a lot of facts and details that were left out. Um, I'm not in your way. And there, Bruce is going to tell you about it tonight. There, his law review article, he, he, he's kind of, it's really fascinating. Uh, 
there's several kind of myths that have surrounded the case many years that uh, Bruce kind of puts to rest. And uh, the, the story about the pro se written appeal by uh, Clarence Earl Gideon, uh, there's more to the story than has been reported. But I'm not going to steal the thunder. Without further ado, let me turn the, the dice over to Bruce Jacob. Please join me in welcome. Uh, those of you in the back, please feel free to, to walk up and uh, sit closer. Don't, don't, don't uh, feel that you have to stand. Um, well, Matt, thank you very much for that introduction. Appreciate it very much. And uh, thank you for welcoming my wife, Ann, uh, for being here. Uh, Ann was involved in almost every aspect of the Gideon case. She helped me do research. She was the typist who typed the brief, and back those, in those days we didn't have automatic typewriters, so uh, whenever I made a mistake, she'd retype the page, and she must have retyped the brief, the brief about eight or ten times. Um, she also was present uh, at the oral argument in the Supreme Court, and she's a Florida lawyer, so it's uh, very appropriate that she, that she be here uh, tonight. I want to thank Matt very much for, um, and all of you, for, for inviting me and, and also for welcoming Ann to this uh, this event this evening. Um, by the way, you've got a terrific president. I've been corresponding with him since last summer, and uh, he, is, he is really something. I don't, I've never run into anybody who's so diligent and so careful and, anyway, so gracious. Anyway, I really uh, enjoyed uh, communicating with him. He's a terrific uh, president for your organization. Uh, can you see me? Move this thing I'm very lucky. It isn't every lawyer who's able to uh, argue a case as interesting as Gideon versus Wainwright before the United States Supreme Court and still be alive and able to talk about it 53 years later. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with, with all of you and uh, thank you all for, for welcoming me. I think I met almost everybody here uh, before uh, Matt stood up and, and began this, this, uh, this talk. Um, Anyway, I hope I get to, if I haven't met you, I hope I get to meet you before the evening is over. Uh, the Gideon case began in 1961. It was a different world that we lived in back, back then. Uh, there were very few women lawyers, just a handful of, of women lawyers in those days, uh, almost no African American lawyers. Uh, courtrooms in Florida, I assume Alabama also, were segregated. White person sat on the main floor, a uh, black person sat up on the balcony. Uh, if you were traveling by car back in those days, most of your trip would have been on two-lane ro uh, two roads. There were not many uh, interstate highways uh, built at that point in time. Um, you didn't see people at, at airports because most people couldn't afford to travel by air. Instead, they traveled by car or by bus, and bus stations were very busy, jammed with people. Beginning lawyers in 1961 earned 3,600 uh, beginning lawyers who just uh, graduated from law school, earned $3,600 to $4,800, and that was annual pay, not monthly pay, <laughs> if you could believe that. And strangely enough, on $3,600 or $4,800, you seem to look better than we do, do today on many, <laughs> many times that much money. Um, in those days, you could buy a man's suit for $25. In fact, the blue suit that I wore when I argued the Supreme Court the, 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 in the Supreme Court in 1963 had been bought by my parents for me on my first day of law school at Stetson Law School for $25. Uh, back then, soft drinks were five cents. When Coca-Cola raised its price to six cents, people were, were just really upset. They asked, how could they possibly raise their, their price? Um, gasoline was something like 25 cents a gallon. A piece of pie cost 20 cents, and if you wanted an Alamo, it cost 25 cents. Uh, screens on TV sets were much smaller. They were black and white in those days. Uh, very few people had central air conditioning. You were lucky if you had a window air conditioner. The population of Florida was only 5 million. Today it's about 20 million. Uh, anyway, that will give you some idea of what things were like uh, back, back in uh, 1961 when this case began. Here's a picture of the Bay Harbor pool room. Uh, this is the place where the crime took place in June 1961. At about 6 o'clock one morning, a breaking and entering took place uh, in the Bay Harbor pool room uh, just east of 
of downtown Panama City, Florida, in the, in the Panhandle. Um, a window in the rear of the pool room had been smashed. A garbage can had been placed next to the window, and the intruder had climbed through that, that uh, broken window. The person, once inside, had drunk some beers, uh, coin boxes in the jukebox and the cigarette machine had been broken into. There was a lot of small change uh, on the pool tables. Um, Clarence Earl Gideon, who was living across the street in a, in a rooming house at the time, was arrested later that morning in downtown uh, Panama City at a, at a bar. Of course, there's uh, Clarence Gideon. Gideon. You've probably seen pictures of him before. Uh, when Gideon appeared in court and pled not guilty, uh, he asked for a lawyer. But the trial judge, Judge Robert McCrary, uh, did not appoint counsel. The rule of Betts versus Brady, which was the 1942 two case to the Supreme Court that then was the, the leading case on the, on the issue of whether you should have counsel appointed for you, um, said, the court said in that case, that uh, you were not automatically entitled to a counsel appointed for you at state expense. Uh, instead, uh, you were entitled to appointment of counsel if there was one or more, if there were one or, one or more special circumstances present in your case which would make it very difficult for you to obtain a fair trial without the, uh, the, without the benefit of, of counsel. Um, so Betts versus Brady said that uh, counsel was required if the case involved some special circumstance. For example, if the defendant was young, inexperienced, <coughs> illiterate, uh, had never been in court before, uh, had some mental illness, in, in any, any of those situations, uh, that was a special circumstance that would require the counsel be appointed at state expense for the for a defendant in a non-capital felony. Um, here's a picture of Judge McCrary. Now, judges have the inherent authority, uh, even today, uh, to appoint counsel in, in any case. Uh, and the lawyer who is appointed is expected to serve without payment of, of fees. Of course, most states now provide payment of some sort when a, a lawyer is appointed. But, but uh, judges have always had the inherent authority to appoint a lawyer in any kind of a case uh, if uh, the, the judge feels that counsel is necessary. Why didn't Judge McCurry appoint counsel for Gideon when he asked for an attorney? Well, probably because there were uh, so many criminal cases and so few lawyers in Bay County where Panama City was located. According to the 1960 edition of Martindale Hubble, there were only 34 lawyers in the county at that time. The county had a population then of 67,000, and of course only a small percentage of lawyers handled criminal cases. How many have no words? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly today, yeah. <laughs> you're absolutely right. Um, and and back, back then in Panama City, there might have been maybe five lawyers, ten lawyers in, in, in that town, in, in that county that handled criminal cases. Uh, I estimate from records that I've gone through that there were about 1,200 serious crimes committed in that county in 1960, 1960 or 1961. Of course, um, not all of of the um, perpetrators would have been apprehended, and not all of those apprehended would have been indigent in, in, need, in need of counsel. But if Judge McCurry had attempted to provide free legal help to very many of those defendants, uh, there just weren't a, enough lawyers to do that. And that was true in, in rural areas in Florida, throughout Florida. In cities, it wasn't that difficult to appoint counsel. The judge could exercise his or her inherent authority to appoint counsel, but, but in the rural areas, it was, would have been very difficult for, for judges to uh, to appoint counsel, because there just weren't uh, many lawyers who practiced criminal law. Uh, let me digress just for a moment uh, to explain what was being done in Florida in the way of providing counsel in 1961. Dade County, where Miami is located, had a defender system in place. Also Broward County, where Fort Lauderdale is located, uh, had a defender system. Uh, and those two counties had about one quarter of the population of the state in those days. Uh, in addition, Duval County, Duval County, where Jacksonville is, had a system for the appointment of counsel um, for indigent defendants. And in 1961, the state legislature had enacted a population act, which provided for the establishment of defender offices in, in counties with between 390,000 and 450,000 people. Hillsborough County, where Tampa is, uh, was the only county in that category, and they were already in the process of establishing a defender office. Uh, also. Uh, some Florida judges, trial judges in other parts of the state were appointing counsel whenever a defendant pled not guilty 
and ask for a jury trial because uh, without counsel, a jury trial is, is uh, pretty chaotic. Um, as I said, every court uh, has the inherent uh, authority to appoint counsel in every case, even if it's not possible to compensate that lawyer, and the lawyers have a responsibility of, of handling that case as part of the privilege of being uh, allowed to practice law. Uh, in 1961, there were about 8,000 inmates in, in the Florida, Florida prison system. Today, there's over 100,000. Seems incredible that it's grown that, that much. Um, based on research by the Florida Division of Corrections at the time, at my request, 65% uh, of these or about 5,200 inmates had been convicted without the benefit of counsel. Uh, most of them had pled guilty, but uh, by my count, about 550 of them had gone to trial, either a non-jury trial or a jury trial, without counsel. Florida and another 12 states, including Alabama, uh, were not automatically providing counsel to indigents in non-capital felony cases. The theory was that the judge would bend over backwards uh, to help the defendant. The judge was to assist the, in questioning prospective jurors uh, if it was a jury trial. The judge was supposed to, or at least we thought the judge would, would raise any issues that might tend to support the defendant's theory uh, of the case. Um, that was the theory. In practice, sometimes this was true and sometimes it wasn't true. At his trial, Gideon cross-examined the witnesses for the prosecution. Uh, Judge McCrory advised him that he did not have to take the stand in his own defense and he did not uh, testify in his own defense. He was convicted and given a five-year sentence for the crime of breaking and entering with intent to commit a misdemeanor to wit petty larceny. Um, petty larceny was because no one was sure exactly how much uh, change had been taken out of the jukebox and the, and the cigarette machine. Uh, in those days, $50 was the dividing line between, uh, between uh, uh, petty larceny and grand larceny. Um, got another picture here. William Harris, who was the prosecutor in both, both trials. McCrary was the judge in both of the Gideon trials, and William Harris was the prosecutor in both, both of the uh, Gideon, Gideon trials. Um, uh, Gideon was given a five-year term based upon the fact that he had been convicted in federal and state courts in the past. Uh, he did not take a direct appeal, but he did what, what many Florida inmates were doing in those days. Uh, he filed a handwritten habeas corpus petition directly in the Florida Supreme Court. In his petition, he did not allege that any special circumstance had been uh, present in his case. The Florida Supreme Court, uh, without even notifying our office, the Attorney General's office, just denied the habeas petition on, on its face because it did not allege any special circumstances. And of course, the law then was Betts versus Brady, which required that there be a special circumstance uh, in order for the defendant to be entitled to have counsel appointed in a non-capital felony. Um, Gideon then sent a handwritten certiorari petition to the United States Supreme Court. And I've got copies uh, for you. Uh, you may have already seen this uh, before, but uh, copy for everybody. Uh, the Supreme Court of the United States asked our office, the the Florida Attorney General's Office, uh, the criminal appeals section that I was in, to provide a typewritten response to Gideon's uh, petition for certiorari. Um, we knew that this probably would lead to the granting of certiorari by the United States Supreme Court. There were four of us in that office, in the Office of Criminal Appeals in the Attorney General's Office. Uh, we handled almost all of the, the um, criminal appeals and post-conviction cases for the state. It seems incredible. Uh, because today, hundred, we have hundreds of lawyers uh, uh, doing, doing that because of Gideon and because of uh, Douglas versus California, uh, which require counsel in, in the first appeal as of right. Uh, Reeves Bowen, a uh, former county judge from Chipley in the panhandle of, of Florida, was the head of our section. He was my boss. Uh, he and George Georgiev had handled cases, a number of cases, before the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Jim Mahorner, who was a law school classmate of mine, had just argued the case of Carnley versus Cochran the year before. I was the newest and the youngest and the only one of the four who had not yet been to the United States Supreme Court arguing a case. And that certainly is one of the reasons why Judge Bowen decided to, to hand the case to me. We, we knew this was probably a, a big case that would, uh, could possibly end up in the uh, overruling of Betts versus Brady. Uh, it was March 1962 when he gave me the case and asked me to file the typewritten response. I was 26 years old at the time. 
I prepared and submitted the typewritten response. And then two years, or not two, two months later, uh, in early June of 1962, the court granted certiorari. Uh, and they asked counsel on both sides, among other things, to discuss the question of whether the decision in Betts versus Brady should be, quote, reconsidered. Should we reconsider the decision in Betts versus Brady? Uh, we knew that the court was on the verge of overruling Betts versus Brady, and that this was probably the case in which the court would do it. Uh, Gideon had not alleged any special circumstances, and that is what made this the ideal case for the Supreme Court to take, a case that involved no special circumstances. This was the, was the vehicle that the court could use to overturn Betts versus Brady and, and decide that counsel should be appointed in every non-capital felony case in which the defendant was uh, indigent. Um, we hoped at the time that, that uh, if Betts versus Brady were to be overruled, that the new decision would not uh, apply to misdemeanors or criminal appeals because we believed it would be very difficult for the state as a financial matter and as a, as a practical matter to provide counsel in all these different kinds of cases. We didn't have nearly as many lawyers then as we do now. Um, uh, I think the bar in Florida at that time had something like 6,000 lawyers. Yeah, <laughs> uh, now I think it's over 100, the same like the, like the prisons, over 100,000 lawyers in, in Florida. Um, <laughs> Yeah, jailhouse lawyers too. Um, I began doing research for the brief immediately, and uh, Ann and I were, that was before we were married, we were married uh, two or three months later, uh, but she helped me in my research. We'd go to the library and work together. Um, in late June of 1962, <coughs> Abe Fortas was appointed to, the, to, to represent Gideon, and uh, here's a picture of Abe Fortas. He had been the editor of the uh, Yale Law Journal. He had been a Yale Law professor. Um, he had been the personal lawyer to Lyndon Johnson and was a member of a very famous uh, law firm in Washington, D.C. called Arnold Portis and Porter. Um, in September 1962, uh, I was still awaiting the brief from, from Abe Portis. I changed jobs. I moved from Tallahassee to Bartow, Florida, which is in the center of the state, to work in the firm now known as Holland and Knight. Uh, Spencer Holland, who was a US senator, was the leading partner in, in, the, in the firm. I was the 14th lawyer in the firm. It now has over 1,000 lawyers. Uh, it was one of the largest firms in Florida at the time. Uh, today, I think a, a firm with 14 lawyers would be considered, considered small, but then it was a very large firm. The people in the small uh, town of Bartow called us the, the law factory. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the Attorney General, Richard Irvin, and my boss, Reeves Bowen, if it would be all right for me to continue handling the case. I had done a lot of work on it already, and they said, sure. I also asked Chesterfield Smith, who was the head of the Holland firm, it was then called Holland, Davis, and Smith. Um, I asked him if it would be all right. He said, sure. He said, take time. I, I said, no, I'll just work nights and weekends. <clears throat> but he said, oh, you know, work is, take, take time, uh, whatever time you need, take it. Um, Chesterfield Smith, by the way, later became a, a president of the American Bar Association. He was a real, very great, great lawyer. Ann and I got married um, uh, at the time of the move to Bartow in, in early September 1962. And throughout that fall, we worked together on the brief. Um, the case, by the way, then, as, as uh, Matt has told you, was Gideon versus Cochran, because at that time, Cochran, H.G. Cochran, was the head of the Division of Corrections of the state of Florida. Here's Ann and me uh, <laughs> getting married. Um, in the evenings, we would work together uh, in our law firm's library, uh, or we would go to the, the uh, Polk County Courthouse in downtown Bartow. We had been given a key to use, and we would walk up the uh, steps, the stairs on the east side of the building and, and, uh, and um, do work in that library. On weekends, Ann and I would drive from Bartow either to the Stetson Law School, which is on the west coast near St. Petersburg, um, to do research in that library, Stetson Law School, or to Tallahassee to do research in the state Supreme Court Library. That library had a lot of historical and old English materials uh, that I needed for my research. The Supreme Court assistant clerk and librarian, Agatha Thursby, gave us a key to the front door of the state Supreme Court building. Um, we would work in the basement where the, the old English materials were kept. Um, 
there were no Xerox machines in existence at that time, and I would point out excerpts in the cases that I needed for my research, and Anne would copy them on by hand onto uh, note cards. When she provided the key to the front door of the Supreme Court building, Mrs. Thursby said, just be sure to lock the door when you leave. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of years ago, I argued a case before the Florida Supreme Court, and it took a while just to get through the front door um, because of screening devices and security personnel. I couldn't help but recall what things were like back in 1962. <laughs> we didn't have um, to worry about terrorism, and um, life was uh, a lot less complicated than it is today. Fortas's brief was filed in November. Uh, 1962. Uh, he argued that a defendant in a criminal case just cannot effectively pre prepare uh, a defense. The defendant usually is locked up and of course uh, he or she is not able to get out on the streets and interview uh, witnesses. Uh, also a defendant who is not trained in the law cannot, cannot really make a, a decent decision whether to plead guilty or not guilty. Uh, he doesn't have the training obviously to defend himself or herself during a trial. And Fortas argued that even if the right to counsel was not a fundamental right as of 1962 at the time of Betts versus Brady. It certainly was fundamental by in 1942. It certainly was fundamental by 1962 at the time of the, the Gideon case. Our brief, as I said, was typed at home by, by Ann, and I made these arguments in the brief. First, historically, the Constitution did not require that an indigent state criminal defendant in a non-capital case um, had to be provided with uh, counsel. The Sixth Amendment said a criminal defendant was entitled to the assistance of counsel for his defense. But the Sixth Amendment only applied in federal courts, not state courts. Also, when the Sixth Amendment was adopted, it only meant that a defendant had the right to have counsel who was retained by him or her uh, defend him, him or her in, in court. Uh, there was no right at the time the Constitution was adopted to have counsel appointed for you if you were indigent. Uh, secondly, under the Constitution as of 1962, uh, the states uh, were allowed to develop their own rules of criminal procedure. Um, we argued that the states should be free to experiment with, uh, with regard to their rules of uh, criminal procedure, including the, the rule that counsel needs to be appointed if you're indigent and, and need counsel. Uh, third, due process in those days it was a very flexible concept. It was different. It had a different meaning than it has today, at least in my opinion. Um, it depended on the circumstances of the case, and that's why the court in Best versus Brady had said you have to examine all the facts of each case and look for special circumstances to determine whether or not counsel had to be appointed. We argued that a flat rule uh, that every, in every single non-felony case counsel had to be provided uh, was inconsistent with the due process, due process clause. Uh, fourth, the right to the appointment of counsel had not yet risen to the level of a fundamental right. There were still 13 states, including Florida and Alabama, that were not automatically providing counsel in, to indigents in non-capital felony, non, uh, felony cases, and only a handful of, case, of, of states were providing uh, counsel in misdemeanors. Fifth, to incorporate the Sixth Amendment, which required appointment in federal criminal cases into the Fourteenth Amendment, would mean that the states would have to provide counsel in misdemeanor cases. Due process protects against the taking of life, liberty, or property. Misdemeanors involve sentences which take away a person's liberty or property, property in the form of fines. Also, if the 14th Amendment due process clause were construed to require an automatic right to counsel whenever property is being taken from an indigent individual, counsel would have to be appointed in all civil cases, in all administrative cases, as well as in criminal cases. We argue that as a practical matter, the states just could not, didn't have enough money or the resources or the lawyers to provide counsel in all those kinds of cases. Uh, six, that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment were to be used to overrule Best versus Brady. The states would have to provide counsel for indigents in all appeals, post-conviction proceedings, and all other proceedings in which a, a rich person, person of means, could hire counsel. The Equal Protection Clause would require equal treatment of all people in every kind of case, civil, criminal, or administrative. And that would also create practical problems and financial problems. Seventh, if, if Best were overruled, this would just lead to claims by convicted defendants that they had received ineffective representation, and of course that's what's happened in the years since, uh, Be since uh, Gideon was decided. Finally, if best were to be overruled, we asked the court to make the new decision prospective, not retroactive, because we hoped that thousands of prisoners throughout the United States would not suddenly be turned loose at the same time. Uh, people often ask me whether I thought the state should win uh, in the Gideon case. 
uh, those of us in the criminal division of the Attorney General's office thought we probably would lose. My personal belief was that every defendant in a non-capital felony case should have an attorney, and I was happy with the results in Gideon uh, on that issue, but that wasn't the only issue that had to be decided. One question was whether the state should make that decision through legislation or court rule rather than having the United States Supreme Court make the decision for us. Another issue is whether the decision overruling Best vs. Brady should be prospective or retroactive in, in, in uh, effect. Still another uh, was which part of the Constitution be, should be used by the court in overturning Best vs. Brady. Should it be the Equal Protection Clause? Should it be the Due Process Clause? Um, if someone had said to me, which side would you rather have, I would have preferred to represent Gideon, but lawyers are trained to take either side of a case. And it's the tradition of the legal profession that a lawyer should be willing to take a case even though he or she is, she personally is not in total agreement with the uh, client or with what the client has done. In my career, for over 50 years, I've represented murderers, murderers, rapists, robbers, burglars, prostitutes, heroin addicts, and others who have done terrible things. I certainly didn't believe in what they did, but it was my job to provide the best defense that I could. The arguments in Gideon were set for January of 1963. We were given an hour and a half. Um, I asked George Mintz, the Assistant Attorney General of uh, Alabama, who had written an amicus brief on our behalf, uh, supporting us to take a half an hour, and that left an hour for me. Ann and I arrived in Washington, D.C. on Sunday, uh, before the arguments were to begin, uh, we met George Mintz at our hotel, stayed at the same uh, hotel as, as Mintz. Uh, the next morning, Monday, um, Ann, George Mintz, and I went together to the Supreme Court. And that was the first time I had ever seen the court or been inside the uh, Supreme Court. And I can still recall my, my first impressions. Before the justices entered the room, I noticed that each justice had a different type of chair. Uh, justice Wizard White a former college and professional football player had an enormous chair, while Justice Black had a tiny chair that was only, seemed to be only half the size of Justice uh, White's chair. Uh, uh, Justice Black's chair was so small you could hardly see it over the fence as you were sitting in the audience. Uh, on that day before arguments were scheduled, the justices filed in, and the first thing they did was to swear in new members. George Mintz moved my admission, and Chief Justice Earl Warren welcomed me to the court. He was a huge man. He leaned over the bench and he said, welcome Mr. Jacob to the bar of the Supreme Court. Uh, at that time I was 27 years old and had been a member of the Florida Bar for barely three years, which was the minimum <laughs> needed to practice before the United States Supreme Court. Here's a picture of what I looked like at about the time. <laughs> and whenever I see this, I'm always amazed at how little I've changed in 50 years. <laughs> The rest of that first day, <clears throat> we listened to the reading of opinions. Uh, one of my impressions on that first day was the informality of the court. I had expected a lot of ceremony, a lot of pomp and circumstances, but the atmosphere was quite informal. Justices would scribble notes, and someone would appear from behind the uh, curtain, take the note, and go back to the Supreme Court library and bring a book and hand it to the, to the justice. Uh, as an opinion was being read by one justice, other justices would talk would get up sometimes, walk out, then come back later. Uh, one justice would get involved in a whispered conversation with the justice next to him as a third justice was uh, reading uh, his uh, opinion. Uh, justice White whirled around in his chair and faced the curtain behind him for about 10 minutes and then returned uh, facing the, the audience. Uh, for a while, Justice William Douglas wrote furiously and then he licked a number of envelopes and pumped them shut on the, on the bench. And uh, Anthony Lewis, who wrote Gideon's Trumpet, uh, told us, that uh, Justice Douglas wrote letters to his friends during court sessions. <laughs> now all this changed the next day, uh, January 16th, 1963, when arguments began. The court became very businesslike. Uh, there was one case before ours, the White Motor Company versus United States case, an antitrust case. The government's lawyer was Archibald Cox, uh, Solicitor General of the United States. He later became the special prosecutor in the Watergate case and was fired, he was the one fired by President Nixon when he began to produce evidence that Nixon and some members of the White House staff had committed crimes. There are backup or ready tail, tables uh, behind the tables of the lawyer's argument case, two sets of tables. Um, 
I was seated at the backup table behind Gerhard Gazelle, who was the lawyer for the White Motor Company. He later became a federal judge. Uh, both he and, both he and uh, Archibald Cox were wearing morning coats and tails. I was wearing my dark blue suit because the clerk's office had told me in a phone conversation earlier that, that a dark suit would be appropriate. No one was seated at the ready table to my right as we faced the, uh, the court. Uh, but as the white case ended, Abe Fortas appeared. That was the first time I had seen him. He had corresponded, but I had, I not, had not seen him until till arguments in the court. He must have made arrangements with the clerk to phone him just before the arguments um, began in our, in our case. He was wearing a brown suit. He was a middle height, dapper looking, and he had a slow, deep, deliberate voice. Soon after he became, began talking, the noon hour arrived and the court stood up and walked out and of course we all, we all stood. Uh, uh, Fortis and I were led downstairs about one floor below the level of the, of the courtroom into a small room about, about this size, about the size of this room. Uh, we introduced ourselves and we sat at a very small table in the middle of the room facing each other. We were the only people in the room other than the waiter who was there only part of the time. Fortis began by apologizing. Uh, he and his wife had sent an invitation to Ann and me uh, to come to their home the previous Sunday evening, uh, two days earlier, for a, uh, along with the lawyers in the, in the cases that were companion cases to Gideon versus Wainwright. Those, those cases were Douglas versus California, involving the right to counsel uh, on appeal, first appeal as a right, Draper versus Washington, and Lane versus uh, Brown. The invitation had gone to Tallahassee, and because I was in Bartow at Holland, Beavis, and Smith, I had not received it. During most of the lunch, he talked about Justice Black and how much he admired Justice Black. He talked about the election case arising in Texas when Lyndon Johnson was running for the United States Senate for the first time. There had been a runoff between the two Democratic Party candidates, uh, Johnson and Koch Stevenson. Johnson had won by 87 votes, but a ballot box in one county had 202 votes for Johnson, all in the same ink and same handwriting. <laughs> That was how Lyndon Johnson acquired the nickname Landslide Lyndon. <laughs> the box with the 202 ballots disappeared. Stevenson alleged vote fraud and went into federal court. The federal judge invalidated the vote. But Fortas, representing Lyndon Johnson, went to Justice Black as the circuit justice for the Fifth Circuit uh, in Black's chambers at the Supreme Court building and convinced Black that the federal courts had no jurisdiction to interfere in a state election. So Johnson won. We returned from lunch and Fortas resumed his argument. By this time, the spectator section was empty except for one person, my wife Ann. It seems strange for a case of this importance to have only one person in the, in the audience. <clears throat> one other non-lawyer was present in the courtroom and that was Anthony Lewis, the reporter for the New York Times and later author of Gideon's Trumpet, who was allowed to sit with his portable typewriter inside the bar to my far left as, as, as we face the, uh, the members of the court. Um, by the way, when you watch the afternoon portion of the argument on the, in the movie Gideon's Trumpet, the courtroom is packed. However, however, that was not true. Ann was the only person in the audience. When Fortis finished, it became my turn to argue. I stepped before the podium and my first impression was that I was down in a pit. These justices seemed sitting, to be sitting quite a bit higher than, than than is usual in, in appellate courts. Uh, may have been my imagination since it's the, the high, highest court in the land. Um, they were spread out far to my, um, to my left and right in comparison with Florida appellate judges who usually sat pretty close together. Uh, also the speaker's podium seemed much closer, closer to the bench than was the case in Florida appellate courts. The podium had lights on it. There was a green light, a yellow light, and a red light for when the speaker was supposed to stop. I don't have the, the red light here, but. Okay. okay, I began to make my prepared argument, but the moment I began, there were questions. Uh, the intensity level was very high. Uh, the justices were very animated, and they took a much more active part in the, in the uh, argument than, uh, than the just judges in the uh, Florida appellate courts. I argued for an hour. Uh, I read the transcript of the argument and counted 92 questions or interruptions during my argument, and almost all of them came during the first half hour. In other words, there were almost uh, three questions or interruptions every minute during the first half hour of my argument. Uh, every justice except Justice Douglas asked at least one question or interrupted at least once. The questions and the comments came from the justices so fast that I had great difficulty keeping up. One justice would ask a question. 
I would begin to answer and another justice, justice would break in and ask a question. I would try to rem remember that question as I try to enter, as I try to answer the, uh, try to answer the first question. Then as I was doing that, a third justice would ask a question or make a comment. Remembering which member of the court had asked the question, what the question consisted of, and in what order the question had been asked was a, was a, a serious problem for me. In answer to a question about Johnson versus Zerbst, the 1938 case, uh, in which uh, the court had required the automatic appointment of counsel in federal cases under the Sixth Amendment, I said that that decision was based on the Sixth Amendment, but also in part upon the supervisory powers that the United States Supreme Court had over lower federal courts. When I said this, Justice Black became angry and red in the face. Uh, he was the justice who had written that opinion. I still think that the, that the answer of mine was a valid, was a valid response or a valid uh, comment. At another point, when I was arguing that perhaps in minor criminal cases it would be fair if there was a judge, but neither, neither side was represented by counsel, Justice Harlan, uh, who probably was the justice most favorable to our, our position, helped me out by saying, careful now, don't go too far. A, he was a big champion of federalism. Yes. Judicial restraint. Yes. Um, I was caught in a crossfire and the questioning was, was brutal. When the arguments ended, Abe Fortas came up to Ann and me in the hallway outside the courtroom. Uh, he apologized to Ann about the fact that the invitation had not uh, reached us in time for us to, to uh, go to the party at his house the uh, previous Sunday. Dulles Airport had just been built. Our plane was leaving from, from that airport. Some, part, some portions of the roads leading there uh, were still unpaved. Uh, on the trip back to Florida, when we entered the huge big terminal at Dulles Airport, we were the only two travelers. There were people behind the counter, but we were the only two travelers in that entire, in that whole enormous room at Dulles. Um, at that time, it was, it was uh, uh, possible to copy single sheets of paper, but you couldn't copy from a book because uh, we didn't have Xeroxing. Um, I had taken 30 or 40 books, law books, big suitcase filled with, with uh, books because it, we couldn't Xerox the opinion. I wanted to have those, those cases with me in Washington, D.C. Uh, back in those days, they weighed your luggage. And we were, we were way overweight and had to pay a $50 fine of some sort. Uh, I don't know if you call it a fine or what. Anyway, $50, which today would be, you know, in, in, in um, purchasing power is probably like five or $600 today. After the case had been argued, H.G. Cochran stepped down as the director of the State Division of Corrections and Louis, Wain, Louis Wainwright became the director. I wrote to the court, to the clerk, and, and told him about this. I did not receive an answer from the clerk of the court, but when the opinion was released in March 2003, almost exactly uh, 50, 50, 53 years ago, uh, the name of the case had been changed from Gideon versus Cochran to Gideon versus Wainwright. Here's uh, Louis Wainwright. Uh, there was a newspaper strike on at the time, and Anthony Lewis, the reporter for the New York Times, phoned and asked to interview Ann and me. We met him at a motel near the old Tampa airport. Um, he told us he decided to write the book Gideon's Trumpet because he had nothing else to do during the strike at the New York Times. Several years later, Abe Fortas was appointed to the Supreme Court. At that time, I was teaching at Emory Law School. Our dean invited him to be our Law Day speaker, uh, telling him that I was on the faculty. Fortas accepted, and when he arrived, the dean brought Justice Fortas into the main lobby. Students and members of the faculty crowded around us, and we, we had a chance to, to talk. Uh, I've always had the highest regard for him. Uh, while, while he was later a justice on the Supreme Court, uh, I was appointed, as, as, uh, as uh, we learned earlier, uh, to another case, and I was, had the privilege of arguing that case, uh, Kaufman versus U.S., uh, in, in front of him. The decision in Gideon was announced on March 18, 1963. Best versus Brady was overruled. The Sixth Amendment's right to counsel provision, which previously had applied only in federal courts, now was incorporated into the 14th Amendment and made applicable to the states. Justice Black, ready for the majority, said that Betts had been wrong when decided. I think he might have done this to squelch any future debates over whether uh, Gideon should apply retroactively or, or prospectively. The Gideon opinion did not specifically answer that question, but if Betts versus Brady was wrong when it was decided, Black could later argue that the court should never have followed it, and therefore Gideon should apply retroactively to cases decided while Betts was in effect. 
It was left uh, for another case, Burgett versus Texas, four years later to tell us that Gideon did apply retroactively. This is Black, who I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Uh, the Gideon opinion contained no discussion of whether the holding should apply to misdemeanor cases. Uh, that issue was dealt with in Argersinger versus Hamlin, Hamilton, um, or Hamlin rather, Argersinger versus Hamlin uh, nine years later. Also, the opinion did not uh, specify whether the decision was based upon the due process clause or the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. The opinion merely said that it was based on the 14th Amendment. I believe that Gideon marked a major turning point in our understanding of what is meant by due process in criminal cases. Clearly, the selective incorporation theory had now become the method for including the guarantees of the 4th, 5th, 6th Amendments into the 14th Amendment. Also, due process was no longer the flexible, amorphous, fact-based test for deciding whether the trial had been fair. In the past, reviewing courts reviewed the totality of the facts after the trial to determine whether the trial had been fair. Now the question was not just overall fairness, looking back at a case after trial, uh, but whether any clear pre-requirements, such as the rule of counsel, must be provided had been violated. Now also there was a federalization of criminal procedure. The federal model has now become the state model, the national model. Uh, federal case law interpreting the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 8th Amendment is now binding on the states. By the way, Matt asked me to, to tell you about uh, the, uh, the story about Gideon, whether Gideon wrote the uh, petition for habeas corpus, the petition for certiorari. Um, uh, Fred Turner, who was Gideon's lawyer at the second trial, uh, told me that, that uh, uh, the person who wrote the petition or dictated the petition was, was um, Joseph Peel, jo yeah, Joseph Peel um, who was a fellow inmate. Uh, Joseph Peel was a lawyer. He was a graduate of my law school. Joe Peel. Um, he, was a, he was a graduate of, of my law school, Stetson Law School. Uh, first, we're not very proud of. He, he, uh, <laughs> he, he, was a, he was a municipal judge in West Palm Beach, and he uh, uh, was in league with bootleggers. And uh, he was making something like $5,000, this is back in the 50s, making $5,000 a week from bootlegging. And um, Judge Chillingworth, who was a circuit judge, learned about this and was about to, to announce it and, and have uh, Peel arrested and sent to jail. Uh, Peel got advance notice of this and he hired, or he had people he was working with uh, pull a boat up to the front of uh, Judge Chillingworth's house, which is right on the ocean. And um, they, they, um, they tied up Judge Chillingworth and his wife. His wife happened to be there. She wouldn't have been harmed if she had not been there, but she was there with the judge. They tied them both up. They put them in, the, in this boat. They went 10 miles out, out into the Atlantic Ocean and dumped them overboard. So that was uh, Joe, Joe Peel. He was in, in prison, and he, uh, according to uh, Gideon's lawyer at the second trial, <coughs> Peel uh, stood over Gideon's shoulders and told him what to say in the, in the petition. And he's the one that did not make, so he's the one responsible for not, not including any special circumstance. In what the, in the movie or what in Lewis's book? This yeah. actually came from you for the very first time. Well, I didn't learn it until until uh, Fred Turner told yeah. me about. It. So. Okay, I just gave, handed out a, a diagram of the of the crime scene. Um, the case went back for retrial, and Fred Turner was appointed to represent uh, Gideon, and at, and at the second trial, Gideon was acquitted. Here's uh, Fred Turner. At the first trial, there had been three important witnesses. One was a woman named Irene Rhodes, who had been sitting on her, on her porch at 6 o'clock in the morning and had seen Gideon walking out of the alley from behind the Bay Harbor pool room carrying a half-empty wine bottle. She saw him get into the phone booth at the north end of the alley. The taxi arrived and picked up Gideon. Second witness was the cab driver, who said Gideon had a lot of small change and paid the entire fare in small change. <laughs> Uh, the police arrested Gideon later that morning at a bar in Panama City. He had had a number of drinks, all paid for in small change, <clears throat> and still had about $25 with him, all in small change. The key witness, however, and the one that could place Gideon inside the Bay Harbor pool room was Henry Cook, who said that after a dance at Apalachicola with some friends of his, 40 miles to the east, 
uh, the friends had dropped him off uh, by the Bay Harbor pool room. He didn't want to go home, he said, because his parents would be angry with him for staying out all night. So he stood there, waiting for the pool room to open at 7 o'clock. As he stood there, he looked through the window and saw Clarence Gideon, who he knew, about five feet inside the window. Uh, the front of the cigarette machine and jukebox had been taken off. Money bags were on the pool table. Obviously, to Cook, uh, Gideon had broken in. Cook then saw Gideon walk out through the back door and walk up the alley, north up the alley, um, which was behind the pool room, obviously intoxicated, um, to the tele telephone booth at the north end of, the, uh, of that block, uh, carrying a half empty wine bottle with his pockets bulging with small change. Cook could see Gideon to his left, through, to the west, through gaps in the buildings as, as Gideon walked north along the alley, while, while Cook walked north along the sidewalk in front of the buildings. Gideon ended up in the phone booth uh, where he made the phone call. After Gideon had been picked up by a taxi cab, Cook had had a conversation with Irene Rose and they agreed that it was Clarence Gideon who they had seen. The police then came and Cook told them what had happened. Uh, Irene Rose told them what had happened. Uh, so Henry Cook, was, Henry Cook was critical to the state's case. At the second trial, Gideon took the stand and testified that he had not been at the Bay Harbor pool room that night. Also, he disputed the state's contention that the small change he had when he was arrested had been obtained from the, from the jukebox and the cigarette machine. He said that he had won that change at a, at a poker game five days earlier, but he had no witnesses to back that up. At the second trial, Irene Rhodes uh, was available as a witness, but she was not called by the state for some reason. That meant that Henry Cook was the only eyewitness against uh, Gideon, and Turner, Gideon's lawyer, effectively discredited Cook. At the first trial, Cook had been asked, quote, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And his answer was, no, sir, never have. At the second trial, Turner, who had represented Cook in the past and who knew Cook had been convicted of juvenile delinquency, <laughs> had been ask. <laughs> yeah, knew that Cook had been convic convicted of juvenile delinquency for joyriding and had been given probation as a juvenile, uh, asked uh, Cook, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Uh, this time, Cook answered, quote, I stole the car one time and got probation for it. Turner then said, quote, the last time you testified in this case, you denied that, didn't you? Actually, Cook had not lied. His conviction was for, a ju for juvenile delinquency, which is not a felony, and it's not even a crime. But the prosecutor didn't realize this. They didn't know about the juvenile history of their key witness. The court allowed Turner to ask this question, Mr. Cook, have you ever denied under oath that you had been convicted? <laughs> been convicted of a felony? And the answer was, yes, I did. So Cook was impeached and discredited because of a supposed lie, even though he had not really lied. In trying to rehabilitate Cook, the prosecutor asked some questions, and Cook happened to mention that his so-called felony case had been heard by a person everyone in the courtroom knew to be the local juvenile judge. Well, finally, the prosecutor realized that Cook did not have a criminal conviction, that he had not lied, and that he should not have been impeached. The prosecutor tried to explain this, but Turner objected and Judge McCrary sustain the objection. Therefore, the key eyewitness uh, who testified against Gideon was impeached on the basis of a lie, but as it turned out, it was not a lie, and he should not have been impeached. Um, Fred Turner later became a circuit judge, and he um, copied the entire file. His gave me a lot of information, including the pre-sentence investigation report that I'm passing out to you. Um, in this pre-sentence investigation report, if, which was given at the end of the first trial, at the, at, after the first trial, Gideon, Gideon admitted that he had been in the Bay Harbor pool room and that he had taken the items that he was charged with uh, taking. He admitted he was guilty of petty larceny, but he said that, he had, that the door had been opened when he entered, and therefore he thought he should not be guilty of the more serious crime of breaking and entering with intent to commit petty larceny. Uh, to the credit of the Florida legislature, Immediately after the Supreme Court decided Gideon, uh, the legislature enacted the statute which, which uh, uh, established defender offices in each judicial circuit in Florida. Since 1963, uh, those of us in Florida have had a statewide public defender system. Uh, of course, all states now have some system for providing counsel uh, for indigents in, in uh, felony cases. Uh, when the Florida legislature adopted the defender, the defender statute in 1963, it included a provision that allowed private lawyers, which I was at the time, I was working for Holland, Davis, and Smith, to volunteer to become unpaid special assistant public defenders. And um, 
on the day that the law, law went into effect, I went to the courthouse and, and signed up and was appointed to handle cases uh, as a special, as a Florida Special Assistant Public Defender before I left practice and entered, uh, entered teaching, law teaching. Let me close my remarks by returning to Panama City, the place where the crime took place. Uh, in September 2000, Fred Turner drove Ann and me to the, bay, the site of the Bay Harbor Pool Room. The paper mill, which is just uh, south of the Bay Harbor Pool Room, it is still there, or was still there. Uh, but the pool room and the buildings in the small community of Bay Harbor had all been demolished. All that was left were the streets and the foundations of the buildings, the concrete foundations. Gideon is dead, Abe Fortas is dead, and no member of the Supreme Court who, who uh, was involved in that case is still alive. Looking back over these past 53 years, I realized that working on this case had quite an impact on my life. <coughs> my interest in law teaching as a career was due largely to my involvement in Gideon. It got me interested in providing legal help to indigents. I started in, uh, programs, legal programs for indigent defendants for prison inmates in several states at several different law schools in Georgia, Massachusetts, Ohio, and in Florida. And even now I do pro bono work for prison inmates and for criminal defendants. During a period of over 50 years, I've handled many pro bono cases for criminal defendants and pr in prison inmates. And just about every one of these cases has been incredibly interesting. Clearly, the most interesting and most memorable experience of my career and my life, however, was being the lawyer for the state of Florida in Gideon versus Wainwright. Thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting Ann and me to be here and for being such a good audience. Thank you. Uh, he died about 10 years later, uh, southeast Florida. He was working in a marina, uh, filling boats with gasoline. That was his job when he died. He lived about 10 years. Uh, he was 52, I think, when the Gideon case was decided. He was about 60 when he died. Never got any more trouble. He was arrested one time for a traffic offense, as I understand it, and he, he gave the judge a copy of Gideon's trumpet, and the judge uh, just dropped the charge. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead. Where do you see the, um, the progress in the delivery of legal <coughs> services to indigents now? I mean, you know, we've made strides obviously yeah. since Gideon, but I think we still have a long way to go. Oh. And in, in many states, in rural areas, even in big cities, it's just like, it's, it's so inadequate. Public defender systems are overwhelmed, you know, understaffed. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, 50 years have passed, over 50 years, and we certainly have not seen 50 years of, of, of improvement. Um, we just don't have enough money. The, the money that we need to have really first-rate uh, defender systems just isn't there. The public, I don't think, is, is willing to put money into it. That's, that's the whole problem. But uh, we've made some progress, but, but it, uh, we haven't gone nearly as far as we should. Uh, Public defender offices are underfunded. I had a former student who's working in the Orlando Public Defender Office office who said they, they just can't do all the work that they should, so they, they use a system of triage, picking you know, pick the case that they think maybe they can win and just disregarding the rest or just sloughing off the other. They, they, they just cannot spend time on every case, which is not the way it's supposed to, that's not, what, not supposed to happen. You should spend time on every case and give every defendant a a fair uh, chance. Go ahead. Uh, Max versus Ohio, was, I guess, came after Gideon. I guess Gideon kind of opened the door about due process being incorporated. Uh, Actually, that was two years ahead. Of this. That's 61. Was it, I guess, yeah. uh, but still, due process, yeah. selectively, the Bill of Rights wasn't applied to the states, like Weeks, for example, uh, just the suppression was in the federal court. And then one by one, but this this case had such significance in moving the Bill of Rights, I think, to the states, I think. That's MAP versus Ohio really was before getting in, and it, it really opened the door. But the problem was with MAP was we weren't sure what it said. And in 1961, when it was handed down, we weren't sure what it, what it did. Uh, we weren't used to having provisions of the Bill of Rights incorporated into the 14th Amendment. We weren't quite sure what was happening. Gideon made it very clear what was happening. But I don't think MAP. At the time, it puzzled those of us who were working in this area. We weren't entirely sure what the court had done. We weren't, we weren't sure of the full significance of MAP versus Ohio. Did you cite that in your case, MAP? 
I don't think either, either side talked about it. I don't, I don't remember, I could be wrong about that, but I, I just don't remember it being a big part of Gideon. Because as, as I said, it was, it's just, we weren't sure exactly what the court had done in Knapp versus Ohio. Now, of course, everybody understands it, but it was uh, not that clear at the time. At least to me, it wasn't all that clear. Go ahead, Paul. Just a clarification. I heard you say that breaking and entering was a felony, uh, but it was, right? Yeah. Okay. Breaking and entering with intent to commit petty larceny was a felony. It was the breaking and the entering that made it serious. Mm -hmm. If it had just been petty larceny, it wouldn't have been all that serious. But breaking and entering is what uh, elevated, it to a, elevated it to a very serious, not a very serious, but certainly five years was the maximum. So it wasn't like robbery or burglary or uh, you know, burglary of a home, for example. But it was, was uh, pretty serious because of the breaking and entering. Go ahead. Uh, was it the combination of the two, I guess, misdemeanors, the major felony? It wasn't a misdemeanor. If it had been petty larceny alone, it would have been a misdemeanor. But it was the breaking and entering with intent to commit the petty larceny. There's a window broken in the back that he, apparently yeah. he climbed through. Broken, it broke the window, climbed through. Um, so that's what. He, when once inside, committed another, the, the misdemeanor. Right. Petty theft. But the overall crime, the crime was a felony because it involved the breaking and entering. So I differentiate between what happened afterwards. Well, they were missing an eye. They were missing two of their witnesses, or well, at least one of their witnesses. Was there an actual witness? Yeah, there was the witness that Henry Cook. He Henry saw Cook. Him, he, he saw him walking up and deep. He, he, he saw him inside. He saw through the window. Right. And then Irene, Irene uh, Cook. No, they impeached him because he said he was I mean, about a prior felony he didn't have. Yeah, he was a, it was a juvenile defense, but he, uh, but uh, Turner asked him, have you ever been convicted of a felony? He said, yes, I have. It was, he, was, he had not been, but he, he didn't know the difference. Go ahead. Do you think there's any reason in law or in policy for um, defendants in civil forfeitures to not have the right to an appointed counsel? if they're poor. Pretty serious. I mean, it's taking away, no you know, taking away a issue person's car or a boat or a yacht or something like that. Yeah. Uh, now, well, of course, if, if they have a, a yacht, would they really need, right. would they really need free counsel? So it could just be like the $2,500 that was in the defendant's pocket when he was picked up on a drug charge. If they, if they really don't have the money, uh, they sh you know, forfeiture of, of a big piece of property worth a lot of money is, is uh, that's the only property he has. He doesn't have any cash. He should be represented, I, th I think. Yeah. You know, I, th I would go as far as, as providing counsel in, in, in many misdemeanor cases as well. I don't know if we'll ever get there, but eventually. Some people would even argue maybe using some of that civil asset forfeiture proceeds to find indigent defense. It's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, idea. Like a trust for indigent defense. Yeah. The A's office would not like that. No, they wouldn't. Who gets the money now? The A's office. The A's office. Cheryl. Reporting for Paris. Reporting for Paris. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Go ahead. I've got a kind of rhetorical question. If the Federal Society was in existence in 1963, on whose behalf would they have filed an amicus brief? Well, the ACLU, no question about which side they, they were on. Interesting. Uh, Federalist? The Federal Society. Well, I had a fellow professor at Stetson who was the, uh, the uh, faculty advisor to the Federalist Society. I am now because he retired, but um, he, uh, he thought that Gideon was a bad case. I, 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 argued, I argued with him, said that, you know, that's not true. We didn't really needed Gideon to be decided the way it had been decided. But he was a staunch Federalist and uh, in favor of um, judicial restraint and so on, and he he did he thought Gideon was a bad case. Well, I don't think it's a bad case, but um, certainly in that day and age, you could make the argument that here's the Supreme Court, all-encompassing Supreme Court, foisting upon the states this additional requirement that's nowhere specifically or explicitly stated yeah. in the Constitution. So yeah. the Federal Society would say, no, wait, this is judicial yeah. overreach. This is big government run amok. Yes. We can't have this, and yet we know now, in hindsight, obviously it was an inevitable, mm -hmm. you know, development of the law, and it was a very necessary step forward in the incorporation of the Bill of Rights. My guess is that the federal federal society back then would have would have said that the states should do it through legislating or 
mm-hmm. or through judicial rule by the state supreme court or other implemented on a yeah. case by case basis or at least or, or the state supreme court or the legislature could pass a rule saying in every case involving the indigent that uh, uh, there should be counsel provided but it should be done by the states rather than by the federal by the u.s supreme court that's, that might be what the Federalists would have said back, back in those days. What is your opinion on the strength of the evidence against Gideon? And I, I know he's acquitted by a jury of his peers, but mm. um, do you think he was actually innocent? I, I was reading a U.S. News and World yeah. Report, and they, they, they were actually referred to his innocence in the case. Do you think that's, that's correct? Well, he, he committed the crime. There's no, no question in my mind. In the he fact that in his pre-sentence yeah. investigation. Yeah. And also the article I, I just I gave you earlier, that, uh, I talk about that, explain, explain why, I don't think there's any question about that, but, but uh, it makes a better story, made a better, uh, it gave a better story for Anthony Lewis. Better theme for his Yeah, better. Th- <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a question back here. Yeah, I have a, I think it's a very serious question. You have a footnote in your article about Irene Rhodes, who noticed that uh, Mr. Gideon left a half consumed a bottle of wine in the phone booth when he left, and she went down and got it and drank it. Yes. How did you learn that? <laughs> That's my um, serious question. <clears throat> um, I think I got it from a transcript. Ah, from one of the, the first, that. maybe the first trial. Okay, I didn't And remember. also from Fred Turner, from Fred Turner and from the trial, the transcript of the first trial. I love that. Story. Yeah, she, and she, and she didn't want to, oh, she did not want any calls. Fred Turner wanted to call her as a witness, and she said, please don't, my husband, Thought I was on the wagon. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want him to find out. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. The uh, report indicates that he was living uh, at the Baywater Hotel, which is a hangout for numerous winos and women of loose morals. And it's definitely at least a third-rate living establishment. Is it still open? All I can say is that when I was there, when Ann and I were there in, in year 2000, every single building in the, within, within blocks had been torn down and all over left with the slabs of concrete where they had stood. So that, that building was no longer there. Right. Well, you, well, you mentioned, and you did a fantastic job in your law review article, but um, Gideon actually specifically requested Turner, right? I mean, he wasn't just yes. appointed. But uh, and he, he wanted Turner to move the trial out of, out of Bay County. And, and Turner yeah. said, no, I mean, why would you want to do that? I know, you know, have Everybody the Bernard. Yeah. And in fact, he put three, according to your law review article, Turner put three gamblers on the jury. Uh, and there were only six men juries, right? Well, he wanted the, he wanted the jurors to believe that, that, that Gideon's uh, the money defense. Uh, he said he wanted them at a poker game, and he wanted gamblers on the jury. <laughs> and. Um, he, t- he tossed two people off. One was, was a man he said would, would, uh, would uh, convict his own grandmother. And the other, what was the other one? The other one was, uh, anyway, anyway, there were at least two people that he, he, he had good reasons for, for throwing. But he kept four, and he added two more, and he ended up with something like three who were known to be poker players, which is what he wanted. Yes, he, he, was a, he was a terrific uh, defense lawyer. He said that he, he... He liked to pick jurors based on their shoes. Yeah, he, he picked, he picked uh, lawyers. No, I, I was the one. I said I understand that, that you know I know that uh, some lawyers pick their jurors because they, the shoes they wear. The shoes they wear. If you're a prosecutor, you want them to be well shined. If you're a defense lawyer, you want them to be kind of you know grungy looking. <laughs> and um, he he laughed about that. He, he told me what tricks he used. He said one time in Bluntstown, uh, which was not his own hometown. Uh, in order to pick the jury, he had a friend who was from Bluntstown uh, standing up, up front. He and, and uh, Fred, no, Fred Turner was up front, and and he, his friend back in the doorway would signal to him either up or down. <laughs> uh, anyway, he, he told me about the different uh, techniques he used to choose jurors. And then, of course, even he, the star witness for the state was his former client, who he effectively. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that, <laughs> it's kind of kind of disturbing. But there were only there were only two uh, criminal defense lawyers in Bay County, Fred Turner, and uh, the other one eventually became the first uh, public defender. There were only two really experienced criminal lawyers. So, uh, who was Gideon to go to? There were only you know only one of those two lawyers. And Fred Turner had the best reputation. Would you tell them too that Gideon had actually? There was a reason he picked Turner. Will you tell the audience? Uh, Turner had represented Gideon's wife, who filed a divorce uh, case against Gideon. 
And so, so the first thing that Turner had to ask when, it, when uh, Gideon had him appointed was, you sure you want me appointed? I can, get, I can back out of this because I represent your wife. There's, there's a conflict of interest here. And Gideon said, no, I want you. I guess he had seen Turner at work in the divorce case. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then Fred Turner said, Okay, I'll represent you, but only if you promise to start supporting your wife and kids. <laughs> if we went, if we went. <laughs> and, he, and the second trial, he didn't actually testify, right? Yes, he did. he did. He did in the first, but he did in the second. Yeah. Fascinating. So the bigger scheme of things, we really have you to blame for people not wanting to pay the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever I see a group of public defenders, they always say, and I always say back to them, I'm the one that's responsible for you getting your job. <laughs> If I hadn't lost, you wouldn't have this job. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Bruce. Well, thank you. Uh, Thanks, man. Thank you so much. Uh, I, was remiss, I was remiss earlier in not introducing him. Would you stand up so I can see you, please? The beautiful bride. She's ever been as comfortable as she is as she was. And, uh, if you I, haven't I read to tell you, I did not. Bruce said I helped him with his research. I did not help him with his research. I, I was not an attorney at that time. All I did was take notes. He, he showed me how to copy. I think it helps. And I typed. Yeah, she, read the article. She's uh, actually in the law library at midnight typing out uh, case summaries and all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank